Now, sensation tells us that an object is. Thinking tells us what the object is. Feeling tells us how the object makes us feel. It's great, it's pleasurable, it's rich, it's satisfying, and so forth. So it's evaluate here. And intuition tells us what the possibilities are in a given situation. Um, Sensation and intuition are the perceptual functions, and accordingly Jung calls them the irrational functions. They simply have to do with perception. Uh, sensation has to do with perception of the exterior world. Intuition has to do with the perception of the within of things, the interior world. This is the world of the mystic and the artist. Um, this is the language of metaphor. And um, intuition itself consists in a kind of you might say right brain thinking in terms of images, whereas thinking is left brain in terms of concepts. I throw the right and left brain in there even though Jung doesn't mention them, but that's how they would be uh, discussed today. Um, thinking and feeling are the rational functions, and he refers to feeling as a rational function rather defensively because he says, well, feeling and thinking are both rational insofar as they are both judgmental. You're making judgments about what is appearing in front of you. But it's interesting to point out that he characterizes himself as a thinking type, and with respect to his system, feeling is therefore inferior. So he's thinking of feeling in terms of his differentiated function of thinking, which is what most people would associate with rationality. So these are the four functions of the psyche. Now we will have either the introvert or the extrovert, and one of these four functions will be predominant. The other one will be, let's uh, use Jung as our paradigm here, and he characterizes himself as an introverted thinking type. So feeling is then bound up in the unconscious. It's in the shadow. And accordingly, it will be very difficult to access. Thinking will come easily but feeling will exist in a kind of archaic, inferior, undifferentiated sense. And so the thinking type may be prone to moodiness, which is the kind of inferior feeling, uh, irrational outbursts, uh, fits of bad temper. That is because feeling, down in the unconscious, has become identified with the collective unconscious. It's bound up down in there. Now he says one of the second there will be a secondary function, what he calls an auxiliary function, from the other pair that is normally paired with the thinking function. And in his case, it's intuition as his uh, auxiliary function. So he characterizes himself as introverted thinking with intuition, secondary. And this, therefore, will be partly in the unconscious, partly conscious, and this one likewise. But it will more readily come to his aid than in sensation. So, as a result of this, when the individuation process begins, the first thing that comes up, according to him, is the secondary function. You sort of have that. And he says, most of my life, I was characterized by abstract thinking. And it became very difficult for me to learn, at first, how to think in terms of mythological images. But it did come. And that marks his break from Freud, when he starts going over to mythology and studying it. and. Uh, begins to learn its language, the first chapter of the book that he writes, the Von Lohmann book, is on the two kinds of thinking, which he calls directed thinking, which is thinking, and passive thinking. Initially, he characterizes intuition as passive thinking because you're no longer in control of your thoughts. You go into a kind of dreamy twilight state, and these fantasies and dreams will come up to you. So he says that the passive thinking is equivalent to fantasizing, daydreaming, and also dreaming at night. And he says the primitive man is much more in touch with this view of the world. The world is a projection more so out of his unconscious than it is for the modern uh, Western scientific man who has analyzed it and pulled it apart. So now um, this begins to come up to him. And he says when the individuation process begins, these other functions, in order to get access to them, it has to be at the cost of or the expense of the differentiated function. And in his case, thinking is the differentiated function, so he has to learn how to let go of that and naturally gives way to intuition. And he starts having these dreams and visions. And uh, 
He has one dream in particular that he said symbolized the whole, the start of the whole process. This is under the whole Neptune train period. He said, I had a dream that I was standing at the foot of the hill, at the foot of a hill, with a, a kind of dark-skinned aboriginal man with me, and we were both armed with weapons. And very far off in the distance, I heard the sounding of, of the horn of Siegfried, and Siegfried began to charge down the hill toward me in a chariot made out of human bones. And he said, as he approached, my friend and I fired our weapons at him and killed Siegfried. And he fell, and then it began to rain. And he said he woke up out of a dead sleep having this dream, and a voice inside of him said, you must understand the meaning of this dream, or you must shoot yourself. And he thought about it, and uh, he was carrying a revolver, a loaded revolver in the nightstand right next to him, and uh, he said, I was very serious about this. I knew I had to understand what this dream meant. So he says on one level, well, actually this is what has to happen to Western civilization right now. The Siegfried ideal of control over nature, the dragon slayer myth, has got to give way now to a certain passivity with respect to learning the will of nature rather than imposing our will upon it. And he says, well, actually, that is going on within me now as well because I'm learning how to let go of directed thinking and give way to the spontaneous fantasies of my nature within me. And so he begins to slowly learn to let go and bring up these images, and he allows them to overtake him on the assumption that what they are communicating to him is corrective and valuable for his life and not, as Freud would say, merely uh, a screen trying to disguise. Freud says the imagery of the unconscious is actually disguising from us these wishes that we have repressed, but that we truly desire, whereas Jung says, no, 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 it's not a disguise. It appears to be a disguise because we don't understand the language that the unconscious is speaking. We've forgotten it. But if we study the history of mythology, we find out what the meanings are by comparing particular archetypes with what they have meant all throughout history. And then when we come back to the language of dreams, we begin to realize that the imagery of the unconscious is expressing itself in the best language that it knows how. And it is compensating the waking consciousness for those uh, over one-sided exaggerations in its attitude that it isn't picking up on. If the thinking type is always thinking and analyzing about everything, he's never going to be feeling. So the unconscious will have all this locked up, and the dream material will be variations of how it is now that he can begin to access these undifferentiated functions, in his case, sensation and feeling. Now his sensation function, which in his case would be the, the tertiary or third function, begins to come up here too, because he said, after I finished my book, uh, Psychology of the Unconscious, I realized that I didn't know what my myth was. And he says, I asked myself the question, what it means to live with a myth, and what it means to live without one. He says, we have dissolved the Christian mythos, and so Western civilization is now moving into a period where there are no overarching guiding myths that everyone agrees upon that is guiding and shaping the culture as a whole. And so he says, as a result, the entire civilization is falling apart, and the world wars were the beginning of that process coming out. And so he says, if the same thing is happening in me, then I have to know what my myth is, because otherwise it will live me. Young's whole theory with respect to free will is that the differentiated function is totally at our command. You have total free will if you're a thinking type, you, you use that totally, but you're at the mercy of feeling. And so the apparent accidents and situations that happen to you will be the direct results of your undifferentiated function. You are at the mercy of what is in the unconscious. And so you must strive to get to know it, bring it up into consciousness, so that in doing so, you will gradually increase your freedom of will, so that you will have all four of these functions over time, and it takes an entire lifetime to do this. That's why it's called the individuation process, becoming what one is in potentia, actualizing those potentialities through becoming a full three-dimensional individual. And so that's uh, the sketch of the uh, process. What indicates in his chart that he's a thinking, that he started as a thinking? I, I want to move right into that uh, here just now, and I just want to make sure that... Uh, <laughs> well, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right on. You're following it. I just want to make sure I haven't left anything out uh, that's important. 